I'm Joe Nye, and Dean of the Kennedy School, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 13th annual Theodore H. White Lecture Press and Politics. The Theodore H. White Lecture commemorates the life and career of one of America's great journalists. Teddy White created the style and set the standard of contemporary political journalism and campaign coverage. He studied Chinese history and East Asian languages while he was at Harvard in the 1930s and planned a career as a scholar. But he went to China, and after witnessing the 1939 bombing of Chongqing, he devoted his career to journalism. And during World War II, he reported on East Asia for Time magazine, and over the next two decades established a solid career as a reporter and commentator. His coverage of the 1960 political campaign, the making of the president, 1960, changed the course of American political journalism with the depth and breadth of its perspective. His subsequent making of the president's volumes and the, and the other works and analysis were informed by the same combination of passion and erudition. Theodore White served on the visiting committee of the Kennedy School before his death in 1986, and he was one of the early architects of what would become the Shorenstein Center on Press and Politics. We've been dis lucky to have a truly distinguished group of people in this lectureship in the past, people like William Sapphire, William Buckley, Koki Roberts, Walter Conkright, Jesse Jackson, Tom Brokaw, and last year, G.D. Rudra. But this year, we're particularly proud to have as lecturer David McCulloch, one of America's leading historians and he will be speaking to us on a sense of history in a time of crisis. My only regret, as I told him, is that I didn't bring my own copy to be signed. <laughs> to introduce David McCauley, I'd like to present Alex Jones, our director of the Jones Sorenstein Center on Press and Politics and Public Policy. Uh, we're very lucky to have Alex in this position. Alex covered the press for the New York Times, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 1987 for his articles. In the 1990s, he co-authored two widely acclaimed books, the second of which, The Trust, The Private and Finan and Powerful Family Behind the New York Times, was nominated for the National Books Critic Circle Award. And to introduce David McCullough, let me now ask you to join me in welcoming Alex. Thank you, Joe. When I think of David McCullough, I think first of a voice. It's the expressive, respectful, gently melancholy voice that is the soul of the epic Ken Burns PBS series on the Civil War. It's also the voice of delight and wonder from the American Experience series, also on PBS, that imagined New Yorkers walking for the first time across the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883, standing higher over water 
than ever in history and seeing seagulls flying below their feet. For a serious historian and a serious writer, and he is both, to also be a TV star and best-selling author is a bit like being a lionized Carnegie Hall cellist who uses the same grace and nimble fingers to play quarterback for the NFL. <laughs> In that respect, he resembles no one more than Theodore H. White, whose talent for combining scholarship and insight with superb storytelling made him, like David McCullough, one of the very, very rare ones. David McCullough's subject throughout his career has been America. He spent a lifetime explaining us to ourselves in books like The Johnstown Flood, which is the story of how human folly and misjudgment led to an entirely avoidable catastrophe, and The Great Bridge, which tells how a feat of staggering engineering innovation, the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, was an equally staggering human achievement. But we know him best for his fascination with three presidents, each of them in their way embodying an American century. In Mornings on Horseback, he brings to life the young Theodore Roosevelt, who watched Lincoln's funeral procession as a child from a window in his home in New York and became the embodiment of American optimism and progressivism and expansionism. In Truman, he paints a portrait so empathic and finely wrought that Harry Truman became an American icon. In a signature McCullough touch, he himself ran pell-mell down the same halls and stairways and corridors of the Capitol that Harry Truman had run at the moment his life changed forever. Truman was called to the phone. Something had happened, and he must urgently come to the White House now. According to McCullough, Truman turned white, put the phone down, muttered, Jesus Christ and General Jackson, <laughs> and started running. He had not been told, but he knew that Franklin Roosevelt was dead. In his book, McCullough makes that run a vivid scene which brings readers into the heart of a man who is both panicked and enthralled at what is before him. His most recent book, John Adams, is set in the 18th century, but in a way, this presidency may be the most timely of all compared to the moment in which we live. It was the time of the Alien and Seditions Act, of bitter partisan strife and anxiety, and a time when there was uncertainty about what kind of country we were and were to become. David McCullough has won the National Book Award twice. He's also won the Francis Parkman Prize twice. He is past president of the Society of American Historians. His John Adams is now in its 34th printing and won this year's Pulitzer Prize, again, his second. His topic tonight, A Sense of History in a Time of Crisis. It is my honor to present this year's Theodore White lecturer, David McCullough. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Alex. I'm uh, honored, to say the least, to be uh, the Theodore White speaker and to be asked to come to this great uh, public forum at our great university, Harvard, which I uh, can look at with total dispassion, having gone happily to Yale. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's a little like being in the Globe Theater, isn't it? This uh, banks of people rising. That doesn't make you the groundlings, you understand, but it is, uh, it is a wonderful space, and I'm thrilled to be here, and, and thrilled that I look out on such a turnout. Thank you. I uh, wouldn't be here, and I wouldn't have had anything like my writing life or the, or the life I've had without my, my editor-in-chief, uh, who is also here, my wife, Rosalie, and I'd like you to meet her, too, please. <laughs> She's uh, Mission Control, <laughs> Secretary of the Treasury, <laughs> Chairman of the Ethics Committee, 
and the star that I steer by. That uh, run that Mr. Truman made back from uh, Sam Rayburn's office to the vice president's office, which I decided I really had to do. I wanted to see what he might have seen in his peripheral vision, what it felt like to make that run. It's a long way. And uh, you can't go up to the Capitol and start running down the halls uh, <laughs> without uh, risking uh, serious problems. So I called ahead to, uh, to the uh, office of the Senate historian and uh, said, asked if, I, if this could be arranged. He said, oh, I know why you want to do this. And I said, he said, and he said, I'll only do it, this was Richard Baker, I'll only do it if I can come too. <laughs> so he had arranged for the Capitol Police to escort us on the run. And we went to Mr. Rayburn's office and there were four police and Richard Baker and me. And we, I wanted to do it at exactly the same time. And I uh, just wanted to see the way the light was and all that. So I said, all right, ready, go. And we started running and we ran down a hall, which was really a long tunnel. And six men in street shoes running down a cement marble brick, whatever it was, hall, was like a roar of thunder. And the, and the path that we took, the course that we took, went right by the Capitol, where the Capitol Police have a sort of a rest place where they can go and have coffee and take a break. <laughs> and they heard us coming. <laughs> there was one policeman out in front, you know, churning along, Dick Baker and me, two, one on each side of us, and one behind. And, uh, and the Capitol Police came rushing out of, the, of their uh, little hideaway there, some of them standing like this, looking. <laughs> and what, of course, they saw was one Capitol Policeman being chased by two unknown, <laughs> two unknown men, followed by three more Capitol Policemen. <laughs> so as we, came up, as we came up to the uh, place where these police were standing, the Capitol Policeman out in front said to them, don't ask. <laughs> Harry Truman never had the benefit of going to uh, college. He was the only uh, president of the 20th century who never had uh, college education, but he never stopped reading. And his great love was history and biography. He said that the only, th the only new thing in the world is the history you don't know. Wonderful line. Uh, Daniel Borston, uh, who was educated in part in this uh, university, who was one of our front rank historians and the former Library of Congress, said that to try to plan for the future without a sense of the past is like trying to plant cut flowers. <laughs> Lord Bolingbroke, an, a, a man of immense influence on the founders of our nation, the English political philosopher of the 18th century, said that history was philosophy taught with specific examples. My own feeling is that history is so many things. It's manifold, its lessons are manifold, but it's certainly an aid to navigation in troubled or turbulent times. Uh, I agree with Samuel Eliot Morrison who said it teaches us how to behave. It also, I think, encourages a sense of, of confidence a sense of humor, patience, and a better understanding of human nature. That's really what it's about. It's about the human story, the human condition. And in many ways, its pull is that it deals with two of the greatest mysteries in life, time and human personality, individual personality, upon which great events, past, present, and no doubt future, will turn again and again, more often than is generally understood. If you don't understand the personality, the character, the makeup, the chemistry, call it what you will, of the protagonists involved in great decisions and great historic turning points, then you don't really understand, can't really understand why things happened as they did. Now, in many ways, there is no such thing as the past. If you think about it, nobody ever lived in the past. Jefferson, Adams, 
Washington. They didn't walk around saying, isn't this fascinating, living in the past? <laughs> Aren't we, aren't we quaint in our funny clothes? <laughs> they lived in the present, but it was their present, and it was different from our present, and that's essential to understand, because we cannot assume, should not understand, that they were just like we are. They weren't just like we are, because they lived in a different time, and they lived in a different culture, and as a consequence, they perceived reality and the world differently from the way we do, particularly if you go back as far, say, as the 18th century or the 17th century. Another very important lesson of history is that there's no such thing as a self-made man or a self-made woman. All of us are the product, are the result, are the, are the turnout of all kinds of influences, the uh, encouragement of teachers, the uh, support or or a belief uh, in our uh, prospects of parents, or that person that reprimands us, the, uh, the, the, the teacher that hands us the book that's going to change our life, or says something in a classroom one day that you never forget, and the friends, and the people, countless numbers of people we've never met, never could meet because they lived long before we do. They wrote the poems that moved us. They they wrote the uh, symphonies that uh, touch us to the soul. They, um, they expressed in words ex aspects of, of human condition, outlooks, insights into life, which are part of us. They're our vocabulary. We, we, are, we walk around quoting them all the time and don't even know it. We think that what we say is ours alone, but it isn't. Every time you say uh, you're green-eyed with jealousy or in a pickle, or a half dozen or a dozen other things, you're quoting Shakespeare. If you smell a rat, if you, uh, if you say mum's the word, that's Cervantes, that's Don Quixote. If you say all hell broke loose, uh, that's uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. If you um, say the fools rush in where angels feel to tre fear to tread, that's Alexander Pope, and on and on. And in the 18th century, they did this all the time. They, they used these expressions all the time. And the 18th century being a more advanced society than ours, they didn't care much about punctuation, spelling, or, or putting quotation marks around anything. And we therefore assume that these wonderfully wise things that they're saying were theirs alone. They weren't. They were quoting Shakespeare, Milton, Cervantes, on and on. And particularly a play called Cato, which was written by Joseph Addison, which had a huge influence on those people. And if you don't understand the influence of Cato on the 18th century Americans who fought the revolution and created the world, the country that we live in, and in a way were responsible for the blessings, the advantages, and the opportunities that we have, then you don't understand their time or who they, who they were. When Nathan Hale was hanged in New York in 1776, young Nathan Hale, school teacher from Connecticut, and he was told he could speak his last words. He famously said, I, my only regret is that I have but one life to lose for my country. Well, that isn't his line. That's from the play Cato. Now imagine you're told that you've got about a minute left to, to live and uh, you can have your last words. Who in the world is ever going to think of anything very memorable? So what did he do? He called up what, in a sense, was scripture in his time. And I think that he delivered that line this way. He said, my only regret is that I have but one life to lose for my country. In other words, this is a line from your English playwright's play, Cato, and I'm telling you, you English officers who are about to hang me, that this means as much to me and my country as the line may mean to you and your country. Now, in 1765, early, the time of the Stamp Act, John Adams, young John Adams, and please keep in mind how young all these people were, and I think that's extremely important for all of us to remember. When George Washington took command of the Continental Army here in Cambridge in the summer of 1775, he was 43 years old. 
He's not the old white-haired fellow with the awkward teeth. He's a young, vital, ambitious, untried man. He's never commanded an army in battle before in his life. Adams, when he rode off to, uh, to uh, Philadelphia to, to attend the Continental Congress, was 40 years old. Jefferson was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Benjamin Rush, to me, one of the most interesting, admirable figures of the whole group, was 30 years old when he took part in the Continental Congress. But in 1765, Adams joins in to this cause, the American cause. And I have to say, I think and I think it's clear from the evidence, from the record, that except for George Washington, no single patriot of that time counted for more, contributed more, and was there longer and with more heart than John Adams. And in 1765, which is the year of the Stamp Act, it's the crucial year, Adams wrote a long essay that appeared in, the Boston, in a Boston newspaper here, the Gazette in which he said that our true suffering has been our timidity. We have been afraid to think. Let us dare to read, think, speak, and write. Let every sluice of knowledge be opened and set aflowing. Let it be known that British liberties are not grants of princes or parliaments, that many of our rights are inherent and essential agreed on as maxims and established as preliminaries. Then, he says, let us read and recollect and impress upon our souls the views and ends of our more immediate forefathers in exchanging their native country for a dreary, inhospitable wilderness. Recollect their amazing fortitude, their bitter sufferings, the hunger, the nakedness, the cold which they patiently endured, the severe labors of clearing their grounds, building their houses, raising their provisions, and so forth and so on. He's hearkening to their past, their story, their history. Now that's 1765. If you jump, jump ahead to 1862, 100 years later, Lincoln says, we cannot escape our history. We cannot escape history. If you jump ahead another 100 years to 1962, you come to the spring of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And after reading the guns of August, John F. Kennedy called Secretary of the Army uh, to the White House. This was Elvis Starr, and instructed him that he wanted every officer in the United States Army to read Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August, how the First World War slipped into happening. He said, according to uh, several accounts, I'm not going to follow a course which will allow anyone to write a comparable book about this time that might be titled The Missiles of October. All three of these presidents, in three moments of crisis and opportunity and danger and uncertainty, are calling up historic analogies and historic sources of strength and understanding. Abigail Adams, sending her little boy, her youngster, John Quincy Adams, not once but twice across the North Atlantic in the midst of winter to accompany his father on missions to France during the war and to go to sea in the midst of winter in the North Atlantic was something that no one ever did even in the midst of peace. And yet she sends her child, her small boy, to be with the father. Why? Because she wants him to have the experience, the education that such a trip and such a time with his father will mean. She's willing, and he, the father, is willing to, wis to risk that child's life in order for him to have this opportunity which, as she said, would be like that of no other young man of his generation. And here's what she wrote to him about why he was to go. It's, a, it's one of the most eloquent paragraphs that I know written by any American in the midst of crisis at any time. And what's so interesting about it is to listen to the quality of the language 
And remember, she's writing to a little kid. They didn't talk to children the way we do now. They didn't address them the way we so often do, mistakenly now. She's summoning, she's summoning the conscience, the outlook, the intelligence of an adult. These are the times in which a genius would wish to live. It is not in the still calm of life or the repose of a Pacific station that great characters are formed. The habits of a vigorous mind are formed in contending with difficulties. Great necessities call out great virtues. When a mind is raised and animated by scenes that engage the heart, then those qualities which would otherwise lay dormant wake into life and form the character of the hero and the statesman. Well, you know he had to go. He, he, <laughs> he wasn't going to stay home. But listen to that last sentence. Now, in, interestingly, he's, she's used the word mind several times. You have gotta use your mind, son. You gotta develop your mind. But then in the last sentence, she says, when the mind is raised and animated by scenes that engage the heart, then those qualities which would otherwise lay dormant wake into life and form the character of the hero of the statesman. It's not enough to have high intelligence. It's not enough to have the learning that is required for responsibility. You have to have heart. Now, Adams Sr. had one of the most eventful of all public lives in our history. He, he, he went places, he traveled farther than any of the central characters, the protagonists of that eventful time, much farther, and at greater risk of life and, and inconvenience and discomfort than any of his contemporaries. He was on the move, but he was also very creative. He wrote, as I hope everyone in this room knows, the oldest written constitution still in use in the world today, the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, in which it says in no uncertain terms, in one paragraph, it shall be the duty of the government to educate everybody. Now, when he wrote that paragraph, he thought that for certain it would be stricken by the legislature when they voted on the Constitution. This was 10 years prior to the writing of our own Constitution, and it is essentially the same structure. It is a rough sketch for our own Constitution. And he thought that paragraph would be stricken. No such paragraph, no such claim had ever been said before. This was a radical statement. In fact, it wasn't just voted through, it was voted through unanimously. And in that paragraph, he specifies what he means by education. And he says that it will include science and literature. It will include natural history, agriculture, and so forth. But it will also include values, as we would say. Honesty, industry, hard work, benevolence, generosity, and he didn't mean generosity of money, he meant generosity of spirit and good humor. It says in our Constitution there will be good humor. <laughs> and, and, and all of these were what he profoundly believed were the essence of society and the only way that our system would work. And in that, Jefferson was in full accord. Jefferson saying that any nation that expects to be ignorant and free expects what never was and never will be. It won't work unless we're educated, informed, well-read, and ready to take on the responsibility of governing ourselves. But Adams went beyond that because he said it isn't just that history or the sense of history and reading and understanding and knowledge and education are going to make us better citizens. He's, he was saying again and again that is the way we enlarge the experience of being alive. And when they talked about the pursuit of happiness, that's really what they meant. They didn't mean longer vacations or more uh, material possessions or greater wealth. They meant the enlargement of the life of the mind and the life of the spirit. And again, they say this repeatedly. Now, as president, Adams ran into real troubles. He had to succeed the greatest man in the world. By and large, the whole world saw George Washington as the greatest man in the world, and I think maybe he was. I don't know who would be second. And, uh, and the greatest man in the world had held the country together under terrific stress and strain during those first years of the new republic under the Constitution. In fact, I think it's fair to say, had there but not been George Washington, we might well have broken apart 
in that early testing time. And we almost certainly would never have won the Revolutionary War had it not been for George Washington. What, when he took command of the Continental Army here in Cambridge in the summer of 1775, he was starting on a journey that would last eight and a half years, the longest war in our history except for Vietnam. He never took a single day of vacation, and he never took any pay. He was emblematic of what devotion, commitment these people had to the cause of America against horrendous odds, up against the mightiest military force in the world, uh, with all kinds of internal problems, such as no powder, gunpowder, no money. You can't fight a war without money. Epidemic disease sweeping through the ranks, three, sweeping through the cities, no way to stop it. Dysentery, epidemic dysentery, smallpox. When smallpox would sweep through this part of Massachusetts, hundreds of people would die day after day. And there was no way to stop it, nothing to do. When Abigail Adams brought her children into Boston to be inoculated for smallpox, she had to make a decision on her own because her husband was in far off Philadelphia and communication took two to three weeks of whether to bring those children in here where they would suffer at the best a wretched experience, violent illness, and maybe not survive. She had to make that decision herself. We have no idea how difficult, how hard life was then. The inconveniences, the, the, uh, the fears, the daily chores and discomforts of life, which we don't even think about. And then, and then imagine after getting up at five o'clock in the morning, someone like Abigail Adams working all day long carrying all the burdens of that family and its financial welfare, the children, and educating them at home because there were no schools. At 10 o'clock or whatever it was, she'd sit down by herself at the kitchen table with a quill pen and a candle and write some of the greatest letters ever written by any American ever. The surviving correspondence of the Massachusetts Historical Society between John and Abigail Adams numbers 1,200 letters. And neither one was capable of writing a dull letter, <laughs> or, or a short one. Uh, they'd, they'd been through everything by the time Adams got to the White House. And then, because of the tumult in France, and we can never underestimate the impact of the French Revolution on our politics here, Adams found himself in a position where all the forces of his the party that he belonged to, nominally, nominally the Federalist Party, were pushing toward war with France, a war we were, again, in no position to fight financially or militarily. And indeed, the war was already being fought, though undeclared, at sea, something that many people don't even know. We were at war with France, but it just wasn't declared. Ships were engaging in battle at sea, and all kinds of forces were pushing Adams to war, and to his great credit, he managed, succeeded in avoiding war, which probably almost certainly cost him re-election. It was a very narrow election, very tightly fought election, and one of the most vicious elections in our history. This was in 1800, and Jefferson was just barely elected. The names, the slander that were used in that election uh, make uh, uh, our modern day dirtiest uh, campaigns look like a beanbag, a patty cake. Um, and I want to give you some examples of it. First of all, remember that in, those, in that time, newspapers were nothing like we know newspapers to be today. They were really political organs, political pamphlets. And they employed uh, every device, including hired uh, hatchet men, to do a number on the opposition. Uh, they were filled largely with, what news they were filled with was largely news from London, interestingly, because they could just glean this right out of the London papers and reproduce it. And one of the most um, effective of these hatchet men, who really had uh, um, no qualms about what he wrote, was a man named James Callender. And now, George Washington had been assaulted by the press, principally by uh, Philip Freno, in the National Gazette. And Washington, for all of his heroic uh, um, life as a soldier, his absolutely fearless uh, performance in battle, uh, was extremely thin-skinned about criticism of any kind and went into a rage over what was said about him 
in the press. He was uh, called a cheapskate, a horse beater, blasphemer, um, and another Caesar. And um, he tried to get Jefferson, who was um, Secretary of the Treasury, to uh, stop Freneau and the paper from running these things. And Jefferson said, no, he, that would be an unwise thing to do because that would be a curtailment of freedom of the press. Well, in fact, Freneau uh, was very much working with Jefferson to write these things about Washington and was employed at the uh, State Department when Jefferson was Secretary of State. Then along came Adams and all holds were down because, um, all bars were down because you, there was a certain reluctance to attack Washington because he was such a godlike uh, and an immensely popular figure. But with Adams, uh, anything they wanted to do was fair game. Callender called Allen's, a Adams a repulsive pedant, a gross hypocrite, and in his private life one of the most egregious fools upon the continent. Adams was that strange, quote, strange compound of ignorance and ferocity, of deceit and weakness, a hideous hermaphroditical character which has neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. <laughs> The reign of Mr. Adams, said Calendar, has hitherto been one, co one continued tempest of malignant passions. <coughs> the historian will search for his, those occult causes. He's, he's a creature of the devil, you see. Occult causes that induced her to exalt an individual who has neither the in innocence of sensibility which incites it to love, nor that omnipotent omnipotence of intellect which commands us to admire. He will ask why the United States degrades themselves to the choice of a wretch whose soul came blasted from the hand of nature, of a wretch that has neither the science of a magistrate, the politeness of a courtier, nor the courage of a man etc., etc. Mr. Callender was being paid to do this by Thomas Jefferson, secretly. And Jefferson, of course, at that time, was John Adams' own vice president. And uh, it was later on, after the election, when Adams discovered that Jefferson had, in fact, been supporting Callender, that it broke Adams' heart because Jefferson had been one of his closest friends, a man he admired among perhaps as much as any he ever knew. They had been very, very close friends during their time in Europe, and it would be 10 years and more before they would speak again. Abigail never forgave Jefferson for this. So as we know, presidents have had rough times with the press. Presidents have become distrustful of the press. They have learned to despised the press, and it all was there from the very beginning. Now, for what he wrote about John Adams, James Callender wound up in jail because the Congress had passed, by a decided margin, the now infamous Alien and Sedition Acts. And the one that we really have to contend with in considering the subject of tonight is the Sedition Act. The Alien Act gave the president the power to, to banish anyone from the country, any alien from the country that he thought was dangerous for the country. And the uh, Republican, or the what, Republican Party was then, as I'm sure you all know, what it later became the Democratic Party. The Republicans said, well, he's just gonna ship people out, uh, send people out by the shipload. Well, as it turned out, Adams never banished anyone. Nor did Adams ever support the Alien Act before it was passed, or the Sedition Act, he simply signed them. And he signed them as a measure or a, a, an act uh, due to the dangers and the uncertainties of the times of the war. There were 25,000 uh, French emigres in the country, many of whom who were seriously uh, bent on the destruction of the country, if in fact we went into all-out war, and nobody knew who they were or which they were. And what the Sedition Act said, in, a, in effect, in essence, was that anybody who defamed, slandered, uh, said uh, uh, outrageous or, or, uh, or, uh, uh, or untrue things about a high government official, particularly the President of the United States, could be taken, could be arrested, tried by jury, and convicted, and sent to jail. In total, along with Calendar, about somewhere between 25 and 30 
35 people wound up serving some time in jail. And this was the first um, experience in our national life of this kind. It was clearly unconstitutional. And uh, as soon as Jefferson became president, it ended. But it's pale, it's weak tea compared to what would happen later uh, in the time of the Civil War, for example, when estimates are that because of Lincoln's dismissal, uh, canceling of habeas corpus, uh, somewhere between 10 and 30 to even 40,000 estimates range, uh, people were jailed, kept in jail, uh, without cause and or explanation or trial. Uh, it happened again in the First World War and again in the Second World War when, as you know, under Franklin Roosevelt, uh, thousands of Japanese were, Japanese Americans were put in camps, 110,000 uh, in all, and um, about 80% of them, slightly more, were American citizens. These were all, uh, all outrageous acts, all against all that we believe in. Uh, they were seen as necessary measures in time of war, and it has to be taken into consideration, too, it seems to me, that after the crisis passed, in each and all instances, these uh, stringent measures uh, were eliminated. We went back to our better angels, as Lincoln might have said. The, uh, the, the point I would really like to make tonight before I stop and we have questions, is this. A great deal about our country has changed since September 11th. And some of the change that has taken place is perhaps greater than we know and has more far-reaching consequences than we can yet know. But everything hasn't changed by any means. And one of the things that hasn't changed is our history. And our history is an infinite, inexhaustible source of strength, inspiration, guidance. People were saying after September 11th, this is the, these are the worst, most dangerous, most uncertain times we've ever been through. Well, they are dangerous, uncertain times, to be sure. And it seems they grow more so by the day. But they are not the worst we have ever been through by any means. And this sense that we have been through more difficult, trying times in the past is important to understand deep inside of ourselves if we are to measure up to what we face as time proceeds. John Adams was asked once in the midst of the War of 1812 by Richard Rush, the son of Benjamin Rush. Richard Rush became a very distinguished Secretary of State about this question of, is this the worst we've ever been through? And Adams wrote a wonderful answer. He said, you ask, this was written in 1814, you ask if I ever have known more difficult and dangerous times. Yes, infinitely more difficult and dangerous times. Every moment from 1761 to 1774 was more difficult and dangerous than this. I've seen a time when Congress was chased like a covey of partridges from Philadelphia to Trenton, from Trenton to Lancaster, from Lancaster to Yorktown, and Yorktown to Baltimore. By Yorktown, he means York, Pennsylvania. I have seen the time when Washington was hunted through New Jersey from Brandywine to Valley Forge, and we all had ropes about our necks then and axes and hurdles before our eyes. We have been through worse times than this in the Civil War, certainly, much worse. In the great influenza epidemic of 18, 1918, 1919, when for some reason, we seem to forget about that terrible experience, that terrible national experience, when over 500,000 people died in an epidemic disease for which no one had any cure, no way to stop it. 500,000 people, that, considering the population at the time, if that were to happen today, it'd be well over a million people dying all around us. They said there wasn't a family in the country that didn't lose someone. And then the Depression, and then the Second World War. I don't, I don't think there was ever, certainly not in the lifetime of anyone in this room, ever a darker time than the last few weeks of 1941 and the first months of 1942. When the Nazi machine was running rampant 
Hitler's armies were almost to Moscow. North Africa was in their hands. German submarines were sinking our oil tankers and other ships right off the coast of New Jersey and Florida within sight of the beaches, and there was nothing we could do about it. Half our Navy had been destroyed at Pearl Harbor. Our, our new recruits were drilling with wooden rifles. We had no Air Force. Who was to say that we would stop the Nazi machine? Nothing ever had to happen the way it happened. Nothing ever had to turn out the way it turned out. Those people in the revolution had no guarantee that they were going to succeed. If anything, well, the reverse looked most likely. And it's the same in 1941-42. Late in 1941, Winston Churchill came across the Atlantic, the North Atlantic, again in winter in the midst of war. And he gave a great speech, a major speech. And I want to quote one sentence from that speech to end with. He said, we haven't come this far because we're made of sugar candy. And he wasn't just a great world leader, he was an historian. David McCullough will take questions. There are four microphones here, here, up there, and up there. Uh, I would ask that you line up to ask your questions and identify yourselves, and please ask a question. Don't give a speech, uh, because we'd like to get as many people uh, in as possible. Yes, sir. Mr. McCullough. My name is Jeff Tanner. I'm a, a Master of Public Administration and International Development student here at the Kennedy School. It's been a great evening. Um, a few weeks back, or yeah, a few weeks back, we had the opportunity to listen to Mrs. Barbara Bush, and it, it was a, a wonderful time. But I was kicking myself afterwards for not asking this question, and I hope that you can shed some light on it. You're you're probably the best proxy in the world. She, <laughs> don't take that too far. <laughs> she she and Abigail Adams share the the common bond that they are the only two women to be both wife and mother of a US president. How would you compare them and contrast them, and perhaps more importantly, how would you compare and contrast their son, their, son, their sons and husbands? Both of them went through wars of, of great importance, and uh, maybe this is a book. <laughs> but. Well, first of all, um, uh, is George W. President Bush uh, uh, comparable to John Adams? No, he's not, but nobody is. Uh, John Adams is one of the most extraordinary human beings who, uh, in our entire history, and I truly believe that if all the presidents of the United States uh, could be given an IQ test, he would come in first. He was a brilliant man whose great heroic time wasn't the presidency. He wasn't an inept president or a failure as a president. He wasn't a particularly effective president. But his great time came after Woodward. And John Quincy Adams, as I hope you all know, is the only former president who ever went back to serve in the House of Representatives. No president ever, had ever done that before, and none has ever done it since. And he said, if my, my fellow citizens uh, here in Quincy would like me to represent them in the great hall of Congress, I would be honored to do so. And it was then that he went back and battled on the floor of the House of Representatives against slavery until his dying day. And he died on the floor of the United States Congress. And if you go to Statuary Hall today, which is the old uh, Library of Congre uh, old uh, uh, Hall of Congress, there's a brass plate uh, on the floor marking where his desk was. John Quincy Adams was continuing the principles of his parents because John Adams was the only founding father who, on a, as a matter of principle, never owned a slave. And if anything, Ad Abigail was even more adamant on the subject than John Adams. 
So there is a continuum about the Adams family. There is no family in our history which has so distinguished itself by selfless public service and a, and a, and a, a dedication to education as had at, at the Adams family. Now George Bush's mother and John Quincy Adams' mother are alike in some very interesting ways. They are both strong women. And they are both devoted to reading, learning. Now, Abigail Adams was not educated. Uh, Barbara Bush, I believe, went to Smith. She had a good college education. Abigail Adams was self-taught or home-taught by her parents, but she never stopped reading. Um, and I think that neither Barbara Bush nor Abigail Adams have ever been afraid to express their opinion in most direct, unambiguous terms. Hi, my name's Mike Walker. I'm an alum of the Kennedy School. Um, I had a question for you uh, that um, reading about Truman kind of came into my mind, and it um, has to do with the Marshall Plan. And reading about the Marshall Plan, which the Truman administration basically committed a tremendous amount of resources to rebuild the economies of, of the Axis powers. Um, I couldn't help but think about the situation with the, the Palestinian um, uh, investment and, and wonder if an investment in the infrastructure of, of that, uh, that part of the world wouldn't have made a difference 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or could possibly make a difference now. Well, I think that the Marshall Plan is one of the great creative achievements uh, in, American, in American civilization. I think it uh, ranks uh, high with the creative achievements of any nation or civilization. Uh, Ch Churchill called it the most selfless act of any country in history. It wasn't entirely selfless because the recovery of Europe was essential to our own economy and our own way of life. But it was nonetheless a big idea, if ever there was, and it was brought off. They made it happen. Um, I want to go back to the 1946 election. In 1946, the Democrats were roundly defeated by the Republicans. The Republicans regained the House of Representatives for the first time in a very long time. Harry Truman had gone out to Missouri to vote. And when he came back from Missouri by train to Washington, he arrived at Union Station and nobody was there to meet him but one person, Dean Acheson. And needless to say, neither of those men ever forgot that moment. In other words, the, the Democratic Party faithful weren't there, the White House staff wasn't there in numbers, the, uh, the, uh, the people who, who might benefit by being uh, uh, looked upon favorably by the Truman administration uh, when their wives or friends, they weren't there. This one, one man, lonely president, coming back to his office, and he sat down and he wrote Bess a letter in which he said, from now on, I don't give a damn what they say, I'm going to do what I please. Because the defeat freed him from his, the shadow of FDR hanging over his head. And the next two years, 47 and 48, were the years that Truman signed into law the, uh, the, the uh, making illegal uh, segregation in the armed forces, sent the first civil rights message ever to Congress since the time of uh, Lincoln. Uh, he uh, the rec recognized Israel, uh, created, uh, introduced the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan and the Berlin Airlift, all in just two years, the best two years of his entire presidency. Because somehow something was was brought into focus for him by defeat and, of course, by opportunity and by the extraordinary people he had around him. And these things sometimes happen. I think the Marshall Plan, like, uh, well, like the kind of intellectual ferment that came out of Edinburgh in the 18th century or what happened in, in Italy in the Renaissance, it was one of those moments where everything came together and it, and it happened. And to, to recreate that kind of atmosphere, to bring together that kind of talent, that kind of, of, um, of uh, spirit of working together to accomplish something <coughs> memorable and important to, this, to the security and future of the world is an exception. Maybe, yes, maybe ha we had a Marshall Plan for the Middle East that might have made a difference with, and with, and with uh, Palestine. 
And I, I don't know how many millions, billions of dollars uh, we've provided for the state of Israel, uh, which some might, some might say that's more even than the Marshall Plan. I don't know. But um, we, we've, we've talked of having Marshall Plans for the cities. We've talked of, ha of having Marshall Plans again and again and again. Uh, alas, they just don't happen. It's something quite extraordinary happens, and it happened then. And let me just say one thing to you. I was conducting a seminar in another noted Ivy League institution <laughs> that will remain nameless. 25 seniors, all major majors in history, all honor students, and I started the first morning session by asking them if anyone knew who George Marshall was. Not one. Not one. Finally, one fellow said, did he maybe have something to do with the Marshall Plan? <laughs> I said he did indeed. Good evening, Mr. McCullough. My name is uh, Tony Serralo. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, president Truman was uh, faced with probably the gravest decision that a president has ever had to make, uh, the decision on whether to, whether to uh, use a nuclear weapon or not. I was wondering if uh, in your research that you found uh, Anything other than the fact that uh, Mr. Truman was faced with uh, sending more American lives that could possibly be lost uh, versus uh, using this terrible weapon. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment on that, sir. No, I never did, and nobody ever has. Um, Churchill called the decision about the bomb the decision that was no decision because uh, there was never any really serious talk of not using it. And um, uh, Many people have based their argument or attacked the arguments that have been based on the number of projected casualties. And the numbers ranged over a, lar a long a span uh, from anywhere from 50 to 500,000. Uh, and some of those projections were disputed at the time. My own feeling is that, uh, that those large numbers did not affect the decision because um, certainly, you know, whether 20,000 lives were going to, American lives were going to be lost or 50,000 or 100,000. The point was, they didn't want to lose any American lives more than necessary. They wanted the war to end as soon as possible. And of course, they also thought it would save Japanese lives, which it did. It was the most difficult decision any president ever made, the most far-reaching and important decision. But he did not think it was the most difficult decision from his point of view that he made. He thought the most difficult decision he made was going into Korea. And what's interesting about that is that going into Korea, and this is uh, sometimes forgotten, at the time was immensely popular. There was great popular uprising to send our troops into Korea at the time Truman did it. Truman's mistake was that he never got authorization of the decision from Congress. And, there, and he referred to it once, unfortunately, as a police action. And of course, they kept reminding him of that again and again as the war dragged on and it got more serious. Uh, by the way, I think the best thing ever written about the Truman administration uh, was written by John Hersey, who was invited to come and spend, I think, five days with the president, uh, with him all the time in the White House, and wrote a short book about it, a long essay which appeared in The New Yorker, at the time when the Chinese came into the war. And if you want to read something about a, an administration, a, um, a group of people under pressure, and trying to do what they thought was right with, uh, as is always the case, insufficient uh, information to go on. Read Hersey's book. It's wonderful. <clears throat> I've tried with two recent presidents, President Clinton and now with President Bush, to get them to agree to let somebody do that now. Um, uh, neither, neither did it. Uh, I talked about, about it with President Bush just recently, and he indicated that he might be very uh, interested and willing to do that, as long as, of course, it was understood that whoever that person was would have to leave uh, when matters of, uh, of security were involved, which, of course, is what it, exactly what Truman did, too. Kennedy, uh, to his great credit, let a film crew come in. And um, uh, that's some of the most vivid uh, uh, footage that we have. Uh, and I think that, and as I suggested to President Bush, this is something they could put a cap on uh, for 10, 20, 50 years, if, if need be, for the eventual library. The problem is now, of course, that letters, diaries, any of this kind of thing can be, can be subpoenaed. And everybody's reluctant to keep diaries, write letters, 
which is going to be a terrible problem in time to come. Future historians are going to have an almost impossible time writing about all of us uh, because we don't write letters. We don't uh, keep, write, keep diaries. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jonathan Chavez. I'm a sophomore here at the college. You talk about how we never live in the past. We're always living in a present. And there are specific realities that confront us with that present, but as we continue as a nation, our past grows and our experiences are tempered by what we know is what's happened in the past. At what point, if ever, in a time of crisis like we're in right now, should the lessons of the past be forced to take a back burner to what we are dealing with in the reality of the present? And at what time are those lessons not valuable anymore? Well, certainly one of the lessons of history is then was then, is now is now. Um, and you have to be very careful. History, they'd say that history repeats itself. Some people say, no, that's not true. Only historians repeat themselves. <laughs> uh, uh, and I'm not sure, for example, that historians are any better at predicting or foreseeing the future than anybody else. I think that uh, you, can, you can use history as a guide on what, when, when Tr Truman wanted to decide he had to fire MacArthur. He sent one of his aides up to the Library of Congress to look up anything he could find from the records about what Lincoln went through when he fired McClellan. Now that was a real sense of history on the part of Harry Truman. I don't know how very many presidents that would have done that. Um, it wasn't necessarily how he was going to do it, but he wanted to guide as a guide. I think now what we, what we really should draw from history, our history, is what do we believe in? What are our fundamental bedrock beliefs? How have we stood up in times of stress and danger and uncertainty in the past? How have we called forth our best efforts and our best attitude? How have leaders led us through the magic or power of words, which is the way they do, have to do? And, and, and I must say a sense of, this may sound strange, optimism. We can do it. We've done it before. Somebody said courage is having done it before. And uh, yes, this is very different, but it's always very different. Every new generation has had to face problems that were unprecedented, different, strange. And that magic, um, all essential, often mysterious, quality of leadership. What is it? It doesn't just come in any one form. And it can emerge, it can emerge in the most surprising ways. Who would have ever thought, given his background, career, his sort of cheap political uh, associations through life, that Harry Truman would emerge as a leader? Let me take the prerogative of the moderator to ask you to comment on your sense of President Bush's sense of history. Has he read The Guns of August? Has he studied the Cuban Missile Crisis? Um, I think that uh, much like Gerald Ford, George Bush is getting a bum rap as to how bright he is, how sensitive he is, and how well read or educated he is. I can tell you for certain that he reads history, biography, talks about it, cares about it. And if he was a little vague on, on uh, the geography of Eastern Europe, let's say, or the, or the new arrangement of what used to be the Soviet Union when he was running for president, yeah, he is no longer vague about that. Um, I'm reminded very often of, what, of the same things that were said about Harry Truman, cartoons that showed him too small for the big chair that he was sitting in, which made fun, people who made fun of that funny Western way he had of talking, that he wasn't very bright, he wasn't very well read, he was a hick, he was a provincial, uh, he was quick to anger, so forth and so on. Um, I think George W. Bush, I think he's doing a very good job so far. I think, I th and I think, and I'm glad Ted Sorensen's here tonight because I think that George Bush's speeches, his speech to the joint session of Congress after September 11th, and his speech to the United Nations, were powerful speeches, powerfully delivered, and and you 
and you felt that the man had the capacity for leadership. And leadership isn't just telling everybody what everybody wants to hear. It isn't just giving you all what you think you want. Leadership often requires calling on people to do what they don't want to do or don't think they have the capacity to do. That was the great force of John Kennedy. He was calling on, he didn't, he didn't say, I'm going to give you this, give you that, and I'm going to stroke you and stroke you and satisfy your political need or what. He said, I'm asking you to do things you never had to do before and to come forth, and it's not going to be easier, it's going to be harder. That was true leadership. And uh, keep in mind, please, that exceptional presidents are the exception. <laughs> they don't happen all the time. And um, if uh, you begin to think maybe um, that uh, the present uh, president of the United States isn't everything he should be, no president has ever been everything he should be. And he's the president we have. And he's the one we've got to try and help as much as we can. And opposition is also help. And I think that the Democratic Party has been a huge disappointment in its feeble opposition in intelligent and, and, and constructive criticism and opposition. We need leadership on both sides. We need independent leadership, too. That's why a place, a school, a, a community like this is so vitally important and why it's so great that it is named for John Kennedy. I quit my job. I threw my career to the winds. I was uh, working for Time Life in New York. I'd been there about five or six years. And along came this brilliant, young, to me, shining example of, of leadership, John Kennedy. And I knew I had to be part of that administration, that uh, new frontier, if at all possible. And I went to Washington, and I wound up working at the U.S. Information Agency under Edward R. Murrow. And it was one of the greatest times of my life. And I was way over my head. <laughs> and then it dawned on me, so's everybody else. <laughs> on that note, I'd like to invite you to join us tomorrow morning at uh, 9 o'clock in the penthouse of this building for a panel that will include David McCullough and others. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. We are adjourned.